And we're live. Hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, ben Brister here. Hope you guys enjoyed that uh, first uh, inaugural weekly Q&A. Um, again, coming back at you guys this week. Uh, Going to be answering another five or six different questions that you guys submitted last week. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in, um, not waste any time. Uh, we're going to be talking about today uh, internal versus external uh, rotation dominance in pitchers. So uh, looking at hip, hip rotation dominance and how that plays a role. Um, only throwing accurately at high velocities, so the, the role of, of intensity uh, on accuracy. Uh, arm slot and velocity links, so what's the best arm slot uh, for maximizing velocity for you. Uh, gaining strength while uh, still trying to, to throw at a high output and stay healthy, so how do you balance those variables. Improving shoulder internal rotation, and then uh, pulling into release, so the, explaining the cue of like what does it mean to pull into release versus pushing into release. So. Uh, without further ado, let's just dive through those. Uh, hopefully we can keep this from getting uh, too outrageously long today. So, how do you tell if a pitcher is internal or external rotation dominant? Okay, so uh, first thing to, to realize is, you know, pitching mechanics themselves uh, are a functional assessment. So while we do have a movement screen to uh, assess and evaluate uh, hip rotation, which uh, you can see one of these up here on the board, or on the, on the slide rather, um, just watching how a guy throws, even without doing a movement screen, you can a lot of times understand and see how their hips are likely going to uh, move in a screen. Um, so pitching itself is a functional assessment. How they actually uh, move on the mound tells us a lot about uh, what their mobility limitations might be. Um, conversely, on the flip side of that, as their mobility actually improves, or we do begin to influence these, these things, you can a lot of times see that play out in the way they move on the mound. Uh, when it comes to actually assessing it, so just to, to answer your question specifically, if you want to tell if they're internal or external dominant, if you have to put numbers on it, um, what we've found is general rules of thumb. If you assess, uh, pro, for us, we like to use prone internal rotation and external rotation, um, just because we're assessing most of our guys in a remote fashion. Uh, in person, supine IRER works, works very well because uh, the clinician can kind of control that a little bit better. But if you see greater than about 45 degrees of internal rotation or external rotation, both of those would be classified as, as a very high degree of range in that, in that segment. So this athlete right here, he's showing an internal rotation assessment. His knees are together, he's letting the feet fall out, um, and he doesn't have very good internal rotation here. So this is somewhere in that 20 degree range. This would be a, a below average um, IR range. Somewhere around 30 degrees, um, of IR or ER is somewhere in kind of middle of the road. We would consider that an average amount of range of motion. And then uh, under 20 degrees, so in this case, the athlete's IR under 20 degrees or right around there would be low. So what we're looking for is if an athlete's gonna be considered an internal rotation kind of dominant athlete, typically you're gonna see those athletes, myself, uh, I fall in this category, over 45 degrees of internal rotation, their, knee, their feet will fall way out to the side and then under 20 degrees of external rotation. So we would go one leg at a time, allow the, the foot to fall the opposite way while stabilizing the pelvis. And again, you're just gonna see way more rotation in IR versus ER. And then the flip side, if an athlete has way more ER and their feet barely go out to the side uh, when they fall out into IR, um, that would be a guy who we would consider more external rotation dominant. Remember, um, this just gives us a little bit, some clues uh, to go on but we really wanna pair this with how they actually move on the mound uh, to see if those things line up. Uh, it's worth noting, like a lot of guys that ask this question, this is a common question that we get, uh, assume that every, everybody has to have like a clear bias in one direction, and that's actually not the case. Uh, a lot of pitchers that we assess, um, that pretty average, IR pretty average hip external rotation, so they're somewhere in the middle of the road, and it's not super obvious uh, which direction uh, kind of they lean on that spectrum. So I would say about 25 to 30 percent ballpark numbers of the athletes we assess uh, have a clear bias. Maybe 10, 15 percent of athletes have a clear internal rotation bias like myself. 10, 15 percent have a clear external rotation bias. So we can get into that a little bit more, but most are somewhere in the middle. So what do you do if you're in the middle? Um, that's what we'll get into here. So the guys who are more external rotation dominant as we covered before, um, these are guys who you can consider more outside movers. The way that they prefer to produce this, this rotational torque uh, through their body um, is you know, more towards the outside of their feet. 
Um, so they're, they're, these are guys that work well with the vertical shin cue. Right, a lot of coaches, I'm convinced most coaches that, that teach this, that's how they threw, and so they think that every athlete needs to move how they threw or how they moved. Um, but again, that doesn't work for pitchers with a different hip structure uh, in a lot of cases. So vertical shin works, works great for these guys. Justin Verlander up here is, is a good example of that, where you can see uh, as he loads into the backside, he's keeping that vertical shin, and his, his feet are almost facing away from each other. His lead leg uh, clears early. Uh, these guys do well, if we kind of correlate this to the weight room as well, they do well with things like a sumo deadlift um, versus maybe a traditional deadlift where, where the feet aren't facing out. Uh, in squatting, they do well with a little bit wider stance squats with the feet angled out uh, a little bit wider. Um, and then when it comes to how to kind of position that back foot on the rubber, you can see Justin Verlander here as he lifts. So his, his, foot, kind of, his, his foot kind of angles back towards uh, second base a little bit. Okay, so that's, that's another, uh, not necessarily a telltale sign, but it's something that can often work really well for the ER dominant guys. Um, so toe out or neutral position on the rubber. Uh, and then these guys don't necessarily do as well with, with striding cross body, because again, that requires a lot of internal rotation to get around that lead leg. If he were to be striding you know, a foot cross body, he'd have trouble getting around that lead leg. Um, internal rotation guys, this is Edwin Diaz, just one example of that. You can see he's actually a guy who um, toe is facing back a little bit, uh, which is semi-unusual. Um, but just notice the knee-to-knee -knee position, how he, how he moves forward, knees facing each other. Uh, that lead leg is a really uh, kind of dramatic example of that. Uh, he'd probably do better doing traditional deadlifts over sumo deadlifts. Um, you know, these types of guys can do really well hooking the rubber. They can do well toe in. They can do well uh, kind of neutral uh, foot to the rubber. Um, they can do well with the foot facing backwards. Um, that's a little bit less common. And then these guys can also do really well striding crossbody. Um, you can see that you know Edwin Diaz has a little bit of that crossbody stride. They don't have to, um, but typically they will stride a little bit more crossbody um, or land with their front foot a little bit more in tibial internal rotation. So that front foot angling in just a little bit uh, to take out some of the slack in that lead leg. So toe, a toe-in blocking angle is, is going to be more common for these guys. So to kind of summarize everything, like what do you do if you don't fit you know, cleanly in one of these two categories? Um, well, it's, it's pretty simple. You can just split test a couple of these different positions and see like where do you throw the hardest, what feels the most comfortable, um, and what gives you the best uh, subjective and objective outcomes. So split testing foot positions, take a bullpen test five to 10 throws with your toe angled in 15 degrees. Five to 10 thro throws with your foot, even with the rubber, five to 10 throws with your foot facing backwards, uh, you know, 10, 15 degrees towards second base. And then 10, 15 throws with your, the outer half of your foot up on the rubber, hooking the rubber. Um, again, that works really well. It can work well for internal rotation guys, um, but it does kind of preset everything uh, into uh, eversion, into internal rotation. So that's really going to, uh, feel uncomfortable if you're in this kind of Justin Verlander camp. Um, I've talked about this before as well, but another quick way to see where a guy who's kind of somewhere middle of the road, like decent both directions of hip rotation uh, fits, is have him do a swing. Like have him swing a bat like he's about to, trying to hit a home run and just, you know, just watch, if you're the coach, just watch what his back leg does. Does he load uh, more like this? Does he load more like this? Um, you know, as the athlete yourself, you can do this test, just video it, just take note of how does your body like to produce rotational power into the ground. And so that can give us some clues as to like, hey, I'm pretty good both ways. I can do both of these. They're both about the same velo. Um, the swing feel can sometimes uncover what your preference might be and what's most comfortable for you. Um, and also just playing with different cues, um, playing with that vertical shin cue playing with kind of the knee to knee, uh, you know, staying through the inside of the foot cue and just again, seeing what works for you. There's not one right answer here. Uh, we can get clues from looking through the assessment. We can get clues from looking how you currently move on the mound. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of our athletes, it just comes down to taking a week or two and just playing with some of these different things to establish like, is this a variable that can, uh, you know, give us one, two, three miles an hour. If, we, if we're going to get a benefit out of there, we'll get it pretty quick. If not, it's, you know, we try it, move on and go kind of down the list of other other things to work on. Uh, next question. So 
uh, I can only throw accurately with high slash max intent throws. Uh, thoughts? So uh, for me, uh, this is a pretty pretty common issue. Um, this is something that I definitely struggle with at, at various points in my career. Um, I find that it's difficult for some pitchers to regulate their intensity with without losing their sequencing. So they have trouble going kind of up and down regulating. They can't go like max effort fastball, BP fastball, max effort fastball, BP fastball. They don't have that really fine-tuned feel that some pitchers do have. Um, for these guys, I definitely recommend, uh, as, at least in-game, having one gear. So think about like, I think Craig Kimbrell is a great example. Like if you've ever watched Craig Kimbrell throw, every single fastball is 97. Like he, like nothing under 96, nothing over 98. Like he's one, he's one gear. Um, what that does is it basically it gets rid of this additional variable of like how the dial, the intensity dial. Some guys like Justin Verlander, like he could cruise at 95 and then dial it up to 102 when he wanted. Um, that's again, that's takes a lot of feel to be able to do. Um, it's a little bit more simple. You can reduce the the variables and complexity by just having one gear, especially as a reliever. Like you go in. You're throwing the crap out of the ball. You're getting out of the game. You're not trying to place like a 3-0 ball, a 3-0 pitch with a different level of intensity versus, you know, an 0-2 fastball. Those should be the exact same pitch mentality, uh, you know, intensity. So that's the one gear approach that can really help if you're struggling with kind of up and down regulating it. So not easing on and off the gas pedal depending on the count. Um, another piece of this as well. So like that's that's kind of a quick band aid for for the issue. Um, but looking at your submaximal throws, looking at your catch play, looking at your long toss, and seeing like is there something clear that's breaking down here um, that could explain it? Um, some common issues when guys are throwing like super low effort. Um, common issues are really softly leg block uh, or kind of aiming the ball. So uh, this is especially common in rehab throwing programs where you're at like 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, you're at super low efforts, but the pitcher's already throwing out of his entire delivery. And this, this never made sense to me, and going through some rehab throwing programs myself, it just, it forces you to actively take your foot off the gas and slow down your lead leg and force yourself to teach yourself how to throw slow, basically. You're teaching yourself to um, not capture that, that energy through your lead leg. You're teaching your arm to take over. You're teaching yourself not to use the center of your body. So I don't like to have guys actually throw out of their delivery, out of their full delivery, like utilizing their whole lower half and leg lift um, if they're under a certain minimum effective threshold. So for me, for me to actually feel like I can transfer that energy through my lower half, through my lead leg, through my pelvis, and use the center of my body, like that ball's coming out over 75 miles an hour. It just is. For me to throw it under 75, I need to actively uh, cheat my lower half to be soft. I need to cheat my arm to take over the throw. I need to cheat my torso to decelerate early. I need to actively put the brakes on. And to me, that's just building bad mechanical habits. So um, really common reason is throw, like really common reason from a rehab standpoint uh, is doing too much throwing out of your full delivery um, too early. What I prefer to do with uh, a lot of guys is do more arm action specific drills. So like if you're starting at 50 miles an hour, like from 50 to 70 miles an hour, let's say, first two, three, two, three, four weeks of your rehab throwing, like do a progression that works you through arm action drills, works you through like trunk rotation drills, um, but doesn't necessarily build in the entire lower half until you get to a certain point. So that's my preference. It's likely something similar. Um, where you're having the arm begin to take over the throw a little bit too early. Um, and so you're losing this uh, overall energy flow from the center of your body. That's likely what's happening. So good question. It's a little bit complex, but I would start there. I would see what's different between your full intensity throws and between your kind of submax throws where you just have no idea where the ball's going. And it's probably because you're losing that ability to like sync everything up from your body and the arm is just an extension and along for the ride. Your arm is likely taking over the throw um, because you're having to actively cheat and down regulate everything to keep the intensity at that level. Hopefully that made sense. Um, I can definitely do a, a more full length video explaining that in more detail if people are interested and if that didn't make, uh, if that didn't make full sense. Uh, next question, could a pitcher's arm slot have an impact on velocity? So 
absolutely arm slot will impact velocity, um, especially at the at the extremes, right? So you think about like a submarine, submarine pitcher and a straight over the top pitcher, who's gonna throw harder? Nine times out of 10, it's going to be the, the straight overhand pitcher. Um, so we'll get into that in a second, but the, the key concepts here, regardless of arm slot, what, what are we trying to accomplish when, when we talk about uh, maximizing velocity and, and efficiency? Um, one is sinking the arm into the rotational plane. Okay, so as we begin to rotate, getting the arm to sink into the plane that the shoulders are rotating. Okay, and th this can go for having a more hunched over arm slot. We're trying to sink the arm into the plane, more upright arm slot. You're trying to, again, sink the arm into the plane, not have the elbow way out of plane up here, not have the elbow dragging way down here. So sinking the arm in the plane of rotation, again, regardless of exactly where your arm slot is. Uh, next, uh, ext the extension demand or lack thereof. So how extended you have to be to create that slot uh, versus how hunched over uh, are you. Again, the more extended you are, the more room your scap has to work behind your body, the easier it is to create uh, more uh, scap loaded positions. The more hunched over you are, um, the harder it is for your scap to actually get up and back and get into some better positions. And then transverse versus frontal plane bias. So transverse plane bi bias, you can think of like a merry-go-round, right? So rotating purely in, in this plane, rotational plane, uh, versus a, a more frontal plane bias. You can think of a, a Ferris wheel. Okay, Ferris wheel, merry-go-round uh, bias. So let's take that kind of approach. Let's look through uh, submarine, sidearm, low three-quarter, high three-quarter, overhand. Submarine, it's suboptimal from a velocity standpoint. It doesn't mean that you guys aren't successful throwing submarine. It just means purely from a velocity standpoint, um, it's gonna be a little bit less less optimal. So it's highly uh, transverse plane dominant. You're, you're mostly leveraging the, the rotational plane. You're not necessarily getting into, uh, you know, ripping down through the ball with that glove side oblique in the frontal plane. Um, you can certainly sink the arm into the rotational plane, but because you're so hunched over, because the, the trunk is gonna be more in a uh, bent over position, bent over posture, more trunk flexion. There's not as much uh, extension demand. There's less room or less ability for the scap to get into as good positions. So one of the things I, I like to say for submarine guys is the hardish throwing submarine guys that you do see, they typically are like the long, lanky, really mobile guys who can use that momentum of their arm swing to get their arm to swing back into these really deep positions. Um, and they happen to have the levers and the limb length and the mobility to kind of make up for being in suboptimal positions. Uh, they can still find a way to throw reasonably hard uh, because of those other factors. So they use momentum to get their arm up and back uh, into that position. But again, in general, that's gonna be suboptimal for velocity. I don't think anyone's debating me on that. Um, submarine and low three quarter. So as a lower slot guy myself, I've been I've been below sidearm before in my career and I've also been sidearm and I've also been low three quarter. There is a kind of magical inflection point somewhere around when the shoulders are level at ball release. So somewhere around like a Max Scherzer arm slot or Jacob deGrom arm slot or uh, just when you get to a little bit above parallel. So right, right when you get the trunk to roughly even, again, you're gonna have a little bit of elbow flexion. So just above sidearm. Um, for me, that's when the velocity kind of skyrockets and any time I would kind of dip my shoulders below, uh, below being even, I'd get a two, three, four, five mile an hour uh, velocity drop, relatively speaking. So something about actually being able to drive downhill once you just are no longer fighting gravity. Again, down here, you're fighting gravity. Down here, you're really fighting gravity. The second you get your shoulders to roughly parallel, for me, that was the ability to actually feel like I could drive down through the ball. I never needed to be up here to get downhill, but there was there was some magical point, and for me, uh, I always I always felt and observed um, the number of throwers that are upper 90s, like really high level throwers. Uh, there's a ton of them who are low three quarter. There's very few of them who are below that that kind of inflection point, and that's been my experience as well. Um, again, this is a transverse bias. So the guys that throw really well from here are going to be the guys that really produce. Uh, rotational power well in the transverse plane. Um, so again, this we'll talk about how to kind of assess that in a second. But again, I produce power really well in that plane. 
less less well in other planes. Um, so for me, that that's where everything kind of slots in the best. High three quarter, again, super common uh, arm slot. Uh, certainly supports high velocity. A lot of hard throwers have kind of a three quarter to high three quarter arm slot. Um, and this is somewhere balanced between uh, transverse plane, so again, merry-go-round, and frontal plane, so think top to bottom uh, Ferris wheel as far as like how, how that force is, how that power is being produced. So there, there's a blend of rotation and there's a blend of the other, uh, frontal plane as well. Uh, overhand, so overhand I'm talking about straight over the top, Tim Lincecum type arm slot where the, the form is pretty much straight vertical uh, at ball release. This is more rare. Um, it does support high velocity potential, um, but it's more rare because there's an exceptionally high extension and lateral flexion demand uh, to be able to clear the, the trunk posture to create this arm slot. So to be able to get, to, it's, it's not just a matter of rotating, and climbing your elbow and throwing from a higher arm slot, right? Like this, this is not a high velocity position. To be able to clear to that high of an arm slot, you need to be able to match that slot with your trunk tilt. So the arm slot is following, again, we're trying to get the arm in plane. So to get a high over the top arm slot, like Tim Lincecum, you need to have a very extended position at landing to clear the way, to rotate, to actually get that arm all the way up uh, while staying in plane. There are, are some pitchers who get over, over the top, but they're not doing it in a high level way. They're rotating in this plane and they're just climbing the elbow and it just ends up being a linear, pushy finish, and that's not, that's not gonna support 95 plus miles an hour. So it's extremely high extension, lateral flexion dominant uh, position. It's hard for a lot of guys to get to, unless they have like a Tim Linscomb uh, degree of flexibility, a ton of thoracic motion, really good hip flexors, uh, hip extension, so hip flexor extensibility. Again, any picture of, of Tim Linscomb, here's one right here. You can see the, pos the position that's required to clear a really high level uh, overhand delivery while staying in plane is very, very difficult. Um, for really high arm slot guys that I've worked with, um, I've seen some kind of patterns from the injuries that you see. So oblique and intercostal issues. Again, there's a lot more frontal plane uh, demand. So the, the muscles in between your ribs and, and the obliques, the core musculature, you're putting more demand on them in those extreme positions. Um, there also seems to be a correlation with uh, spondylolysis, uh, low back like stress fracture issues uh, with guys who have a ton of extension or, or super high arm slots. Because think about it, you're putting your, your anterior core musculature, your lateral core musculature in, in more extreme positions, but the backside, so the backside of, of your vertebrae, you're also creating compression there as well, potentially. Um, so just, a couple observations I've had there there might be some potential like core and low back injury links as well from getting yourself into more extreme positions however these guys typically have very high carry fastballs because they're able to come through and create that high uh, high axis uh, on their fastball so typically see high vertical break which is a positive uh, my theory is that there's a higher lat involvement as well with guys who are really able to get over the top and pull down that there, there may be some additional demand on the lat, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. And that for sidearm guys, it may be a little bit more demand uh, on the pec fibers. So a little bit more demand here, a little bit more of a pulling down with the lat from an overhand slot. That's just a theory that would have to be studied. So take this a step further. Um, your arm slot should match your trunk posture. So if it doesn't, like that's where I would first look. Um, most pitchers will throw hardest with a low three-quarter to three-quarter slot. So somewhere between, again, trunk parallel to a three-quarter slot is where most pitchers do slot in, but that's also where most of them uh, will have their, their best results. Th again, this has balanced contributions from both the transverse and the frontal planes. You get to sidearm or submarine, it's purely transverse plane rotation. You get to straight over the top, it's more frontal plane and it's really hard to get into. Um, Sidearm or submarine typically will sacrifice velocity. Um, already covered that. So what do you do if you, if you are finding that you're out of plane? So if your elbow cheats up, if you notice from a front view that as you begin to come through, your elbow is up over the line of your shoulders. So maybe my shoulders are here and my elbow is still up here. So I'm cheating it up. Or maybe my shoulders are here and my arms here. 
if you notice that the elbow is cheating up, um, you have two options, right? You can either raise your posture to meet the arm, or you can lower the arm to meet where your trunk, uh, your trunk angle currently is. Uh, both of these options can work for guys who are climbing the elbow. Um, if it's a guy who they're climbing their arm up here, um, the first thing, the easiest thing to try, we'll, sometimes we'll tell them like throw sidearm. Just try throwing sidearm, like for a few throws, like try throwing sidearm. And a lot of times they'll go from pushing their arm like this through release to allowing it to actually sink into the rotational plane and the VLO will spike up that way. We're not actually trying to get them to throw a sidearm, but this can work just to, just as a feel to get their arm to actually slide in plane. And then conversely, again, you can have the trunk meet where the arm is, so the arm is up high. We can also just try to get more actual uh, trunk tilt. So from there, when they actually stride towards the target, we try to think about staying a little bit more tall. So as they do rotate, it clears a higher slot versus uh, driving towards the target in a more hunched over posture. As they rotate, it's gonna clear a lower slot. So the degree of extension in, in your posture as you rotate is going to dictate how the arm actually comes through the zone. So again, there's, there's more at play than this. Um, the trunk is gonna again follow what the pelvis is doing. The pelvis is influenced by the ankle hip. There's more at play, but when in doubt, just go and split test it. Play with a couple of different slots, see where you throw the hardest from, and see what syncs up best for your mechanics. Uh, next question is, how do you keep your arm healthy while gaining strength in the gym? So let's break this down. Uh, first off, good strength training emphasizes proper form first, overloading, um, appropriate exercise selection, so we're not doing overhead push presses, we're not doing kipping pull-ups, like picking good exercises for this for pitching, um, and then appropriate workloads and progression. So not being an idiot, not adding 100 pounds a week to your deadlift and thinking that's going to be a good idea and go on forever. Um, arm injuries really shouldn't happen in the gym itself if you follow those those three just general common sense rules. Um, so I think what you're really asking is well, how do you actually minimize the effect of fatigue on throwing? Um, like how do you actually balance getting stronger while also still trying to throw regularly and throw hard? So one of the main keys here is uh, making sure you maintain a lower volume in the weight room, uh, overall total volume, uh, when you have a higher velocity throwing phase or higher workload throwing phase. So this, this would be in a preseason, in season, or any sort of uh, really high velocity, uh, high volume throwing phase in the off season. So if you're doing a really aggressive like velocity training program in the off season, during that six week period, for example, you probably wouldn't wanna be hitting five sets of 10 squats every other day or some super high volume uh, upper or lower body lifting work as well. So during these periods, our focus is probably gonna be less strength and, and muscle size or hypertrophy oriented. It's gonna be typically lower volume, so lower reps, maybe three sets of three, um, maybe five sets of three, instead of three sets of 10, three sets of 12, four sets of eight. So lower reps and lower weight as well, focusing on power or focusing on absolute speed in most cases. When it comes to keeping the arm healthy while you're trying to, again, balance the two, um, some of the main keys here are, one, listening to the arm. Uh, this would be considered auto-regulation, but making sure you actually are listening to the arm. If you're sore, if you're hanging, um, that's a sign that you need to back off for a day or two. Um, you'd be shocked how simple this is and how many guys just ignore this advice. Um, avoid regularly throwing through fatigue. Uh, fatigue is the number one risk factor for injury. Uh, I believe it's a 36-fold increased risk of injury uh, that ASMI found in, in a 10-year study um, for pitchers who reported they regularly threw in a fatigue state. You know, some astronomical, uh, astronomical percentage if you regularly throw through fatigue. So some tips for that, avoiding high pitch counts early in the season, uh, taking your recovery days as actual recovery days. So if you're taking a light day from throwing, don't turn that into an 80, 90% uh, intensity throwing day. Actually just take, treat, it, treat that as a day where you're taking your arm for a walk you're not turning into another velocity day. Um, excess throws in the bullpen, so in season, uh, this can especially be, be the case where you don't need 50, 60 throws to warm up. 
to go into the game to throw an inning. Figure out how to get yourself ready with, you know, 10, 15 throws in the bullpen and be able to go in the game. Again, you're going to get more warmth in the game. You're going to have your game intensity throw. So that's an area I always struggled with uh, until I learned that lesson is not doing, not over warming up in the bullpen before going into a game. And then again, goes back to auto regulation, making sure you communicate with your coach how your arm is feeling. Don't just leave your arm out to dry. Go pitch the day after you just threw when your arm is hanging. Um, to go along with this, adequate warm up uh, and throwing workloads. Again, huge piece. Uh, as far as the order of throwing and lifting over the course of, like in your training, um, making sure when at, whenever possible, try to do your throwing first in the day and do your lifting as like the last thing in the day. If you have to throw, if you have to lift before you throw, try to do your lifting like early in the day, like first thing in the morning and have a pretty good gap uh, between the two. Um, typically not a good idea to do like a heavy upper body lift and go through a bullpen immediately after that. Like. I know athletes who have been forced to do that in spring training or in college and they go on and they tweak something because they're going straight into a high intensity throwing session in a fatigue, immediately fatigued state. So definitely don't do that when it comes to upper body lifts. Lower body lifts, like you're probably not gonna have a great bullpen, but there's an argument for learning to throw in a fatigued state where your legs are fatigued. I would not fatigue your upper body or grip and immediately go and try to throw a bullpen. Uh, arm care routines, so make sure you have a arm care routine that addresses uh, all the major muscles, all major decelerated muscles and, and supporting uh, stabilizer muscles of your upper body. We talked about this at length. Email us if you have questions about that. Uh, and then individualized correctives. So with our athletes, um, we're, we're already working on any red flags they have. So if they have a weak rotator cuff, uh, if they have uh, limited upper scapular rotation, uh, if they have bad tissue quality, um, we're already working on these things as well on a daily basis. Next question, uh, how can I improve uh, internal rotation in my shoulder? It got really sore, couldn't sleep on it, turned my thumb down. Uh, it got progressively worse, but I haven't injured it and I haven't thrown in months. So to me, this does sound like an injury, even if you were able to play through it. Um, but let's just break this down. So is limited range of motion the issue or is it limited strength, right? I, I know you're assuming that more range of motion here is better, um, and that might be the case, but let's just, let's break this down. So first, range of motion. Uh, when it comes to range of motion, it's not just about increasing internal rotation. It's not just about the internal rotation number. Um, what really matters is the total arc of motion. So the total, total arc is the amount of internal rotation you have. So you can think about, let's say I have, you know, 45 degrees or so of internal rotation. That's part of the arc plus the amount of external rotation that I have. So I have 100 degrees of external rotation from here to there, and I have 40 degrees of internal rotation from here to here, then I would have 140 degrees of, that would be my total arc of motion for my shoulder rotation. So comparing the, the non-dominant side to the dominant side, the total arc is what actually matters. So here's a, a study that kind of explained that. Um, Basically, just to summarize, what they found is that you could look at this internal rotation deficit. You're gonna, in pitchers, you're going to find that the throwing shoulder typically has less internal rotation than the non-throwing shoulder. You're going to see a, a loss of internal rotation. But does that actually matter? And so what, what they explain here in this particular paper is that that is a normal adaptation for throwing uh, and in pitchers. You're going to find this in pitchers in general. Um, it's not considered an actual issue unless that total arc of motion is, di is significantly different between sides. So if I have 10 less degrees of internal rotation on my throwing side and 10 more degrees of external, that's a normal adaptation to throwing. But if my total arc is 140 on my throwing side and 180 on my non-throwing side, now that starts to get to what they would classify as, as pathologic. So they said pathologic uh, GERD is present when a greater amount of IR range of motion loss than ER range of motion gain on the dominant shoulder exists, uh, resulting in a deficit on the dominant shoulder compared to the non-dominant shoulder. Okay, so here's here's the really crazy part. So if you have more than a five degree deficit between these numbers, there's a 2.5 times risk of increased risk of shoulder injury and a 2.6 times increased risk of elbow injury. Uh, the authors here suggest that there's a link to uh, basically 
your posterior cap capsule and the posterior cuff, so the back side of your shoulder, uh, develops tissue restrictions. It gets really s dense, gritty, tight. Um, and so that being one of the reasons that you see this, this huge imbalance. So here would be an example of, of a test uh, to assess this. So we assess this from a side view. Uh, they'll submit side view video. Um, it's important here to know he's like he's stabilizing his scapula, so the, the clinician here is stabilizing the, the shoulder and the scapula, so he's actually just purely assessing shoulder motion versus getting a ton of scapular motion as well. He's stabilizing the shoulder, so that range is happening purely at the shoulder. So let's touch about on posterior shoulder uh, density. So if it is a range of motion issue, it's entirely possible that you could have you could have some issues in that posterior capsule, posterior cuff tissue quality. So you might have some densification there. Um, one very simple thing that you can do is take a ten, I'd start with a tennis ball, you can build up to a lacrosse ball, but in that pre-throwing window, take two to five minutes to, again, land your side, put that ball right behind the back of your shoulder, search around. Spend a second searching around when you find it, you will know, that you, you will know when you're on the spot. Um, but typically when you grab your shoulder, just grab the, the meat of your shoulder where your fingertips are. It's going to be somewhere in that range right in there. But again, explore in that area. When you find it, you'll know. Um, the key here is a lot of people spend 30 seconds rolling out a general spot. They'll just take a ball. They'll do this for 10, 30 seconds, and they'll move on. Um, what this one research group from Italy, the Stecco group, uh, found, that they're fascial researchers. Uh, they found that it does take a sustained, uh, focused uh, stimulus, so pressure and friction, where you actually stay on that spot and you do these kind of micro oscillations. So if this is the back of my shoulder, I'm going to stay on that spot. I'm not just going to like roll over it for 10 seconds. Stay on that spot, micro oscillations across the fibers, and you're going to stay on it, so again, somewhere between two to five minutes until you feel that pain sensitivity die down. So you first go on it, it's an 8 out of 10 pain, you can't stand it, stay on it. A minute later, it's a 7 out of 10. A minute later, it's a 5 out of 10. Another minute later, it's a 3 out of 10. That's a sign you're actually hydrating the tissue, you're creating that, that neurological and uh, that actual tissue, uh, tissue effect, tissue response. So again, the micro oscillation, stay on it. You can also add in, in this uh, image right here, you can add in a cross body stretch, a little bit of active release, you can add in just active uh, rotation of your shoulder as well. But that's a really good one just to start uh, regaining some of that extensibility and, and proper tissue quality and hydration of that posterior capsule and posterior cuff. Second thing to realize when it comes to internal rotation, go back to this picture right here, right? We're assessing internal rotation. Um, you can't really differentiate that. Uh, you can't look at that in isolation from what the rib cage is doing. So, I, again, I can get my arm this far down, right? What happens if I'm in a super extended posture? So let's look at my rib cage. If I'm in a really extended posture, again, I'm exaggerating. That's as far as I can get my arm down. If I'm in a super hunched over posture, that's how far I can get my arm down. I didn't change anything at my shoulder, but you can see there's a 15, 20 degree swing at what my shoulder can do based on my rib cage position. So there are actually quite a few breathing drills, um, which I won't get into in this video, um, which can basically work to, for guys that are in a ton of uh, extension, get the rib cage back down, and that can restore uh, some functional internal rotation at the shoulder. You're not actually uh, increasing the ire at the joint itself, but you're increasing the amount, uh, you're increasing the uh, amount of kind of thoracic flexion, you're getting the rib cage and pelvis back in a better relationship. And so you increase the actual functional uh, amount of range of motion that you have to use at the shoulder in that internal rotation position, if that makes sense. So that's the range of motion piece of it. Um, but again, the flip side of this is don't forget the strength side of it. So while improving the tissue quality is never a bad idea because bad tissue quality doesn't uh, contract as well or lengthen as well, um, weakness and fatigue are definitely kind of your biggest injury red flags. So if you're throwing in, if you're throwing with a really weak posterior cuff, or you're throwing in this fatigue state, you're definitely asking for injury. If you haven't, again, already, I would argue that you may already be dealing with like an injury, but um, you're definitely asking for a worse injury and to, to continue to make this problem worse. 
one of Louis Simmons' uh, quotes. Uh, again, he just passed away, which is uh, very unfortunate, but one of my favorite quotes from him is that weak things break. I think we all un intuitively understand this to be true. Weak things break, um, and this certainly applies when it comes to the shoulder. One of my favorite ways to actually test uh, shoulder strength is with uh, the Arm Care app. So I've written about them before. I, I, love, the, I love what they're doing. I love the app. I love, I love the company. Um, they basically send you a dynamometer, which is like a st uh, strength sensor. You strap it onto your wrist, it syncs up to an app on your phone, and you can basically test how strong are you in internal rotation, how strong are you in external rotation, how strong are your scaps in various positions, how strong is your grip, and it gives you basically how do you compare to pitchers at your age, and then how do you compare in terms of the actual ratios and the symmetry. You want to make sure your accelerators and your decelerators have a certain strength balance between them. And so it breaks that all down for you and can help pinpoint if you have weak posterior cuff, weak internal rotators, weak scapular muscles, weak grip, uh, and you can track that over time. So to me, this is, this is a no-brainer um, for, for what they've built. This is really awesome. Here's just a screenshot from the app. Um, but again, you can just see it, it breaks down all the metrics. Um, the test takes three minutes to do. You can do it every day. You can do it once a week, um, you know, depending on what you want to do. Coaches can have their athletes do it and then monitor their fatigue levels over the course of the season. They've built out, uh, you know, dashboards. It's, it's a pretty cool system. Um, but for me, that's a great way to actually test uh, shoulder strength. When it comes to training it, if it is a weakness issue, um, you're going to want something that trains it in the stretch position. So it trains it in that position, again, as you go into ball release, your posterior cuff is a decelerator. So you're gonna want something that trains it in this range down here. You're also gonna want something that trains it in that fully shortened position back here. So this is a seated dumbbell external rotation. Um, one of my favorites for learning to control the shoulder into internal rotation. You gotta be careful with this and start it, uh, use good form and start it relatively light. Um, but this is a good one just to learn to control yourself into the end range internal rotation. So you might have to start with five pounds here. Um, a good number on this is about 10% of your body weight for 10 reps. So that's something to, sh to build up to over time. You don't want to just immediately go to that the first time you try these. Please don't do that. Um, half kneeling external rotation is another good one. Um, if you have a coach or athletic trainer that can do these, uh, manuals are actually amazing for uh, posterior cuff because they can perfectly match the strength curve. They can give you the perfect amount of resistance through the entire movement, um, whichever exercise you're doing. Um, and then some sort of uh, cuff timing movement. So we've all seen uh, shoulder tubes. Uh, we've all seen body blades. Uh, the shoulder sphere is actually a great product to work on this. Um, you can take a, have a partner and have a partner move your arm around in various positions. Um, but working on the actual timing and co-contraction of all the muscles that surround the scapula and the shoulder. Takeaway to answer this question. Uh, one, take care of your tissues, especially the backside of your shoulder. Two, strengthen your cuff and get your cuff strength assessed if possible. 10% um, of your body weight for 10 reps. So that would be a 20 pound dumbbell on this movement. Be able to knock out eight to 10 reps. Um, I mean, I typically will use a 15 pound weight uh, for my sets on this. Um, and I'll do a bunch of sets, but a 20 pound weight for 10 reps as kind of a long-term goal to shoot for, definitely don't go out and try that right away. Um, and then just make sure we're, you're also assessing the rest of your body, uh, strength, posture, you're making sure you're attacking and addressing any other issues throughout the rest of your body. So get assessed uh, if you haven't already. Final question for today, what does pulling into release mean? Can you explain this? All right, so I think a lot of us are generally probably familiar with, with this cue. This is something I've talked about a decent amount. Um, so first thing to point out, pulling into release is a, it's a feel that when an athlete gets into good scap retraction, um, what that feels like from here, from this point right here, to bar release, is it feels like you have something to actually pull with, with your chest. Um, so it's, it's the ability to, again, we can kind of track how his arm gets to that point. He has to be able to let it freely pendulum along this plane right here by relaxing everything on the anterior side of his shoulder. So he needs to be able to relax the pec, relax the anterior delt, not have a ton of 
tension built up in those muscles, right? That takes him into this position of deep scap retraction. Okay, so that's step one. Just be able to pendulum your arm back behind your body because you don't have any uh, huge kind of restrictions and you're able to relax everything on the front side. Okay, so if you can't do that and you probably have issues with the pec being super toned up, the anterior delt being super toned up, the bicep tensing early, the upper trap tensing, being able to relax these allows the arm to again take that natural pendulum path and have a, have a shot of getting back up behind that midline of the body. Okay, from there, the trunk goes first. So the actual trunk, the initiation of trunk rotation, uh, the arm is up in a, in a position to accept that rotation and be able to go into accept layback. But the trunk is the first thing that actually fires. So the arm gets up. The arm isn't the first thing that fires. The trunk is the first thing that goes. And that creates a pull through that chest pull through that, that arm side pec, creates a pull, and then a fire, and then a slingshot. And so what's happening here, if you look at the angle of, of the trunk, angle of the shoulders, versus where the arm is, he has you know, 12 to 18 inches of space between, between those two lines. He drew, drew one line between his shoulders, and then one line where the elbow is. He's got a lot of space there. But now we take him to bar release. He's closed that gap. So the line between his shoulders and the line and where his elbow is, uh, those are now parallel. Those are now even with each other. So he's at, as he rotates his trunk, his arm has closed that full, uh, you know, foot plus gap from being way back behind his body. To as he rotates, that arm catches up from here to there. It catches up, and at release, those those two, the elbows in line with the shoulders. So that's where the pulling feeling comes from. Um, I used to tell people to think of like a pec stretch. Um, I've since realized a better way is just like feel like you have something to pull with. Feel like you can pull into release because it's not really, it's not like a tearing sensation. Like if you go into a pec doorway stretch and like really sink deep into it, it's not, it's not a super aggressive stretch. So people will go into it trying to think they're supposed to feel a super aggressive, deep, like tearing stretch. Um, it's really more just like feeling like you relax and float into a, a deep position and that you have something to pull with into bar release. So hopefully that explains what the, what the pulling into release uh, should feel like. And again, there's, there's a ton of involvement from the pec here and a ton of involvement from the lat as well. From the side, uh, one thing to look for, uh, if you feel like you're pushing or you can't feel that, that pulling feeling into release, um, Okay, so two clues, basically. Uh, one, if your lat doesn't get sore, if your pec doesn't get at all sore, but you are getting sore in your, in your tricep or in your bicep, uh, that can be a sign that as you're beginning to rotate, the arm is creeping out in front of the trunk rotation. Okay, the second sign is that from the side, as you're hitting peak layback, it's happening, your elbow is, is hitting peak layback in front of your face. So if you're able to pull into release as you hit peak layback from a side view, the elbow is going to be back behind the nose. So you're going to, you're going to see, see if I can show this. As you go into layback, you're going to hit max layback. It's going to be somewhere back here. Guys that are pushing, it's going to be out here. So it becomes really obvious the guy who's, they lag it behind. Ben Joyce, Tennessee, really good example of of being able to delay the arm and get just crazy, crazy deep positions. Does it lag behind? Does it shoot forward? The guys that shoot forward, that becomes a tricep driven acceleration. The guys that are able to keep the arm relaxed and back and pull into release. Again, that's a pec driven movement. The arm unwinds, unfurls, and at ball release, elbows in line with the shoulders right here. Hope that explains that. I know it's a little bit more of a technical answer, but again, that's one of the simple cues or, or feel like I'll ask somebody, hey, were you able to feel like you had something to pull with? And another key here is that these slightly heavier balls exaggerate the feel of this. So a lot of times I'll have athletes, uh, have pitchers initially play catch with a six or seven ounce ball. It helps them feel that momentum, 
uh, of, the, of the handbrake, drive them into deeper positions and gives them something to actually uh, pull with. It gives them more feedback of where their arm is in space. So I'll make sure, really make sure that we've addressed any tissue issues. I'll make sure that they're emphasizing relaxing uh, into that pendulum action and then we'll give them catch play with six or seven ounce balls to exaggerate that feel and see if they can carry that feel over into the rest of their catch play, long toss, bullpens, whatever. You guys know that definitely dragged on a little longer uh, than I was hoping for. However, uh, hopefully that was entertaining, interesting, and kind of spurred some more questions from you guys. So uh, go ahead, keep dropping your questions down below. I will get to as many of these as I can. I'm trying to answer these in some level of detail. Um, but again, I could try to get to a few more of these uh, next week. So go ahead, let me know what you guys are thinking about, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks again for watching. Uh, go ahead and subscribe if you're not already subscribed to the channel. If you don't follow us on Twitter or on Instagram, search us up, Trade Athletics, and we look forward to interacting with you there as well. And then again, if you guys are struggling with anything in your own careers, uh, either as a coach or as a pitcher yourself, shoot us an email, contact at tradeathletics.com, and we look forward to hearing from you. See you guys in the next Q&A.